Happy American Thanksgiving for starters. I want to welcome you to the third presentation of our live online socially distanced UBC Senior Scholar Series for 2020. Uh, I'd like to first acknowledge that this event is taking place on the unceded ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, and we're grateful to live and work here. The Senior Scholar Series is an initiative of the UBC Emeritus College, formerly the Association of Professors Emeriti. It's been run in conjunction with Green College since 2011. Three more of these presentations will take place after New Year's, all on Thursdays at five o'clock. Kay Teschke tonight will be followed by Jane Koop from the School of Music on January 21st. And you can find details on the Green College and Emeritus College websites. Uh, Kay and I'll have a 40 to 45 minute conversation, followed by a Q&A. Now for the Q&A, we would like you to type your question or your comment on chat at the bottom of your screen at any time during the hour, and I'll pass it along to Kay during the Q&A. Or if you have your video on, you can raise your hand <laughs> during the Q&A segment and we'll unmute your microphone so you can ask a question out loud. But if you don't have your video on, then we can't see you to acknowledge you, so that won't work. Use the chat then. Um, at the end of the hour, if Kay is, is willing, so let's be nice to her. She'll hang around and answer any further questions you might have. We call this segment of these talks happy hour. So feel free to leave. But if you would like to stay, pour yourself a glass of wine and stick around and chat for a few more minutes after six o'clock. Now to the reason why we're here. Kay Teschke is Professor Emeritus in the Faculty of Medicine School of Population and Public Health, where she taught for 33 years in the fields of occupational hygiene and environmental health. Her more than 200 published papers involved research into respiratory and gastrointestinal illnesses, Parkinson's, cancer, and back injuries, as well as a significant detour into issues of cycling safety. Kay sits on the board of WorkSafe BC and on various road safety boards. In 2016, Canadian Cycling Magazine named her one of the 14 most influential Canadians in cycling. Why 14, I ask? Maybe we'll find out. She took a roundabout route to get where she arrived via economics and law, BCIT in Berkeley, University of Washington, motherhood, cycling, and who knows what else. So let's find out. Hi, Kay. Hi, Jerry, and hi to everyone. And for those of you who are from the US, I know some of you are. Happy Thanksgiving. Now, have you gone for a ride today? I have not. I haven't even gone for a walk today, I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I did go for a lovely ride earlier this week over to the uh, River District, so. <laughs> nice. All right, so, so um, a lot of us I know in academia um, ended up in a much different place from where we started or where we thought uh, we'd arrive. Could you begin by telling us how you got into occupational hygiene? You can go back as far as you want. Like <laughs> as a little girl, do you always dream of being an occupational hygiene? I think when I was a little girl, I was like, um, 99% of the population or more, it doesn't, didn't even know it existed. So yeah, I, I actually came out to um, British Columbia after I finished my undergrad degree in economics and went to law school here. And I was very young and everyone had told me I'd be a great lawyer because I love to argue. <laughs> I found out that you had to use other people's arguments, which was very unsatisfying. So I quit law school <laughs> and um, and I needed a job. I had no income. So um, uh, new to BC, I heard that it, you could get these fantastic high paying jobs at the sawmills down on the um, Fraser River. So I went down and there were a couple of sawmills in the row and I knocked on their doors and they all kind of laughed at me and said, I like to say they just said, we don't hire women, but almost certainly they said, we don't hire girls. <laughs> it was in 1973. And, um, but on my way back uh, to get the bus home, 
I passed by this little plant called McGill Industries. And I didn't know what it was, but I went and knocked on their door and it turned out they were a place that made, it was a pillow factory. And they made pillows for all the department stores and, and so on. And um, they gave me a job because I had sewed all my clothes when I was a kid. And I got this job in the basement of the operation where they cleaned feathers. And my <laughs> job was to take the pillowcases that the seamstresses upstairs had sewn and stuff them with feathers and then sew the end clothes. And I was in a room all by myself. It was warehouse sized, dark, dark, dark. It had the classic one little light from a string at the ceiling. And of course the sewing machine had its own light. And I was a middle-class kid and I could not believe the working conditions. I was shocked. Do we call this a sweatshop? <laughs> Yeah, you would call it a sweatshop. They were, it was definitely very, very low wages. I, I can't recall now, but I think it was maybe a few cents above minimum wage for those of us who were sewing. I'm not quite sure about the mechanical staff that ran, ran the chicken feather cleaning operation. Anyway, it was the era of um, uh, the, uh, David Barrett government. They had just been elected about a year before. And I'd heard on the news that if you could unionize much more easily, because all you needed was half the people to sign up. And as a small shop, less than 20 people. And I don't know, really, I don't know where I even thought of this, but in any case I did. I went to the Ministry of Labor, got the sign up forms and uh, signed up, easily signed up, more than half the people in the shop. Not everyone though. And um, then I had to choose a union. And I don't know how I chose the union, but I came up with this union called KMAO, uh, which eventually joined Unifor, which of course still exists. Um, but that was many, many years K later. What did, KMAO, what did KMAO stand for? Sorry. Uh, the Canadian Association of Industrial and Mechanical and Allied Workers. Okay. Hey, I'm impressed. I may have gotten that wrong, but in any case, yeah, so um, we uh, uh, unionized uh, the place. They were, the, the people at the union were amazed. They said they, no one ever came with all these half sign up <laughs> farms and they couldn't believe it. And uh, one of the things I may not have told you, Jerry, in advance is that the, the um, shop asked me, or the, the union asked me to help them with the negotiations and um, they, the company hired a labor lawyer and we bargained over things and eventually the raise was pretty substantial. It was uh, not quite doubling people's salaries, so it was really substantial. And there had been one woman uh, who especially was really worried about joining the union. She, had, she didn't join the union. And a year later, I had a different job, but uh, not in that plant. And the union asked me to come back again um, to help them with their negotiations because I knew the people in the plant and they wanted to make sure there was some continuity. And that woman who had been so nervous, she had been worried that they would lose their um, Christmas bonus. And she was the first one who showed up at the union office to decide on what they were gonna ask for that year. And I was, I was so happy to see her because I was worried about the fact that she didn't want to join the union. And I said, oh, you're here, I'm so surprised. And she said, Kay, a raise, was way better than a Christmas bonus. <laughs> it made me so happy. But in any case, that, that negotiation was also really interesting because I remember that everyone decided that they would ask for 75 cents an hour, which was about another, you know, kind of 25% raise at the time. And the owner of the factory agreed to it right away. He hadn't hired a labor lawyer because the labor lawyer had cost him in the first round more than the salary increase. So, wow. So, anyway. so the union asked you to be part of the negotiations yes, because, yes. because A, you, you worked at the factory and mm -hmm. you had brought the union, you had brought the unionized 
uh, workforce to them, or B, mm -hmm. because you like to argue, or C, because you were <laughs> lost, a law school dropout? No, no, just because I knew the people there, I don't even think I probably told them that I was a law school dropout. Okay. I mean, I did come armed with lots of reasons, you know, how much they could, um, how much the management could increase the price of a pillow. I think it, I, I figured it would cost them five cents per pillow um, to achieve the wage increase we were asking for. So that was your economics background coming into <laughs> well, play. It was, I think it was called <laughs> elementary. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, yeah. Anyway, there's no question that, um, you know, being in that factory was such a shock. And um, later on, when I was working in a different place, I had the opportunity to um, attend a seminar that was put on by the, the union in that um, workplace. And it was put on by this fellow from Workers' Compensation Board. His name was Al Riegert, and he was an engineer, and his field was something called industrial hygiene, which I had never heard of before. And I went, and I thought, wow, this is what I want to do. So what mm. industrial hygiene is, for those of you who don't know, it's um, a prevention field in occupational and environmental health. And the idea is you measure uh, contaminants. It can be chemical contaminants in the air, it can be noise, it can be radiation, and the idea is both that you measure the exposure and then you figure out control measures to prevent those exposures. So my, although I did my undergraduate major in economics, I had plenty of uh, undergraduate science, and that was, uh, it was love at first sight when I, I uh, <laughs> saw that field. So from then on, I started pursuing ways that I could get specific training in industrial hygiene. So you went to BCIT first? I did. In BC, the only place that I could find anything to do with industrial hygiene was through the public health inspection program at BCIT, now called Environmental Health Officers, but uh, they had one, two courses in uh, occupational hygiene. And later on, I found out that uh, in the US and UK, there were master's programs and PhD programs in this field. And so then I went down to Berkeley and did their master's of public health in occupational hygiene. And um, was it a coincidence that you ended up back in BC teaching at UBC or had you kind of set your sights on working in the kind of in the region where you had first discovered this, uh, this. You know, I, I had location. imagined myself working as a, as, a, as a hygienist, either in industry or for a union or for a government agency like works at BC. Uh, certainly I had, and in fact, when I first, the, the attraction to BC was by now I had met my husband who was here. <laughs> So that definitely was a draw uh, back. But it, the first job I had after I graduated from um, Berkeley with my master's degree was actually up in Yellowknife. I was the, hygien the government hygienist for the entire Northwest Territories, which at the time included Nunavut. Wow. And so I, I did that only for a year just because uh, I was lonely and I uh, finally came, got a job at UBC. Um, back here, but uh, it was a fantastic experience working up in the in the north. Um, yeah, got to fly around in small planes to remote places and see all sorts of different kinds of occupations up there, including people who packed soapstone sculptures, and they come packed in this foam that is that is mixed on site that involves isocyanates. It's highly, highly allergenic. Um. So how did you um, how did you find your academic niche? Like how did you narrow down this very broad field to um, the areas that you ended up doing your research in and, and teaching? Right. Well, so uh, it was very serendipitous. When I first came to UBC, I was I had a master's degree. I was hired. Um, to work with uh, epidemiologists and to train medical officers of health who needed some occupational health to go with their public health training. And um, 
so that kind of set the stage. I did eventually go back while I was working at UBC. I did my PhD at the University of Washington. But um, what I ended up doing really was um, working on the exposure side of studies of the effects of hazardous agents on disease. So you're trying to look at the exposure response relationship between an, a specific exposure and a specific outcome. So at the beginning, you listed all these different diseases I worked on. It's not because I was an expert in any of those diseases. <laughs> it's because I was the exposure assessment expert who worked with a variety of different um, physicians or epidemiologists or respiratory folks uh, on those projects. And, you know, it was really great for me. Um, I know that in the US especially, uh, academics tend to narrowly specialize. In Canada, I think that's less the case. Um, but some of my colleagues did. For example, I had a very good colleague, Susan uh, Kennedy, whose specialty was um, respiratory diseases. And I worked with her on many, many different projects. But what was so great for me is each of those projects involved completely different workplaces. And the exposures could be wood dust, it could be gases from pulp and paper mills, it could be uh, chemicals used to process x-rays, it could be smoke, um, materials used in the theater and movie industry. So all these different exposures. And for me, that just made the, uh, the work very rich and interesting. Now, I understand that the next chapter of your life, professional and personal, began with motherhood. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, one thing I didn't mention, well, a couple of things I didn't mention. One thing I didn't mention is one of the very um, characteristic ways to think about occupational health and exposure control is to think of it as a hierarchy. And you try to, first of all, just completely eliminate the hazard if you can. But if you can't do that, then you engineer something that will minimize exposure. And then if that doesn't work, you might come up with administrative workarounds like training or scheduling that minimize exposure. And then finally, if, if you're really at a loss, then the last resort is meant to be personal protective equipment like a respirator, or, uh, which of course we're very familiar with now. Um, the other thing I didn't tell you yet is that when I went to every university that I went to and when I was going to work at UBC, at least 50% of the year, I rode my bike. And I was always a very relaxed bike rider, willing to ride most places, although there are certain places I prefer to ride. And when my daughter was born, I was getting pretty old. I was 41. It was in the early 90s. And when she was born, I started thinking about riding my bike with her. And you know how kids ride, right? <laughs> well, especially when they're, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, they can't keep a straight line. And, you know, I started thinking about what the kind of routes we provided in Vancouver. I mean, these, there were bike routes, but they're just residential streets with a label on them, as far as I could tell. And so I thought, you know, I'm like, working flat out and being a mom, not a young mom, an old mom. <laughs> um, but I thought, you know, maybe when uh, my daughter's a little older, I'll see if I can somehow get involved in bike advocacy. And it just so happened that when she was 10 in the 2003, I think it was, I noticed in the Courier that there was this ad for a different um, City of Vancouver advisory committees. And one of them was a bicycle advisory committee. And you had to apply. And so I remember on my application, I said, there are two things that I think I can offer. One is that I'm a mother and I care about my daughter biking. And the other is my field is about um, controlling exposure. And there's this hierarchy of controls. So, I have no idea what the reasoning was behind it, but I got on the committee and um, there were 12 people on the committee. Eight of them were men and the rest were women. So much very typical bicycling ratio. 
And what happened is that committee met once a month with staff from the city and one counselor. So it would usually be transport engineering staff and they'd come and they'd show these plans. And uh, usually it was a painted bike lane between parked cars and moving cars. And I thought, wow, that's not the way I remember riding in Holland or Denmark. And I would ask questions about why and they'd say, oh, well, it's actually safer to ride on the road than to ride off road all this crazy stuff and it wasn't just the transport engineers that were saying this it was also the um uh, the people the men on the committee and even some of the women on the committee and i thought wow you know i'm a researcher i know sometimes uh data show counterintuitive results and so i thought okay you know maybe that's true and um, but I thought, you know, I'm a researcher, I have access to the scientific literature, I should really get out there and look at it. And so I had a young uh, undergrad student, which is unusual for us in public health, all our students are grad students, but once in a while, someone would email us and say, can I do my final project with you? And I thought, okay, I'm going to ask her to help me with this lit review. And she did. And not surprisingly, I mean, you can say this about any kind of research. I can see lots of gaps. Pretty typical to, if you ask people where they wanted to ride, uh, which people, I forgot to mention that on this committee, people would say, you know, you may think it's not, uh, you don't want to ride on the road with, um, with uh, traffic, but once you get more experience, that's where you'll want to ride. And I thought, of course, I've been riding for decades, but I still don't feel that way. But in any case, so that's one of the things I wanted to look at. And so the research we found was mainly telephone surveys asking people, where would you like to ride? And they offer three choices. One was on the road, one was on a bike path, and one was on a bike lane. And at that time, I wouldn't have been able to tell you what the difference between a bike path and a bike lane was. And I wondered how many people on the phone would know. So I got together with uh, people from TransLink, and uh, several of the municipalities also provided funding. And we did a survey, TransLink did a survey that we designed that asked people about 16 different route types from international situations each person was shown three photos of each of the route types and we asked them to say where they'd be willing to ride and guess what no one really wanted to ride on the road with people driving <laughs> is that a surprise <laughs> any of you who ride bikes anyway um wouldn't so people want wouldn't wouldn't people prefer designated bike trails that were yeah. off the road altogether? <laughs> yes. So the favorites, the absolute favorite was a bike path away from traffic, sort of right. like our seawall paths, and only for bikes. The second one was a multi-use path where people walking and biking are in the same off-road uh, situation. And then the third one was something at the time that we didn't have, and that was uh, on road, but separated. separated bike lanes, physically separated bike lane, which we now have in many places, including the Broad Bridge, which is the big test case. Um, yeah, so it was very clear, and um, I presented the results of that in maybe 2006 to this bicycle advisory committee, and you know, it actually taught me one of my late career lessons that I should have learned much, much earlier as an academic. And that was, I presented the results, people were really interested in it, and they saw, you know, what kind of routes got, were people preferred and which ones they didn't like. And then I'd come to the next meeting and we'd get, you know, these plans and they'd be the same thing. And uh, people would, around the committee would say, well, I think it should be like this, and I think it should be like that. And I would go, well, actually, the evidence from our survey was called the Cycling and City Survey. The evidence from the Cycling City Survey show that people <laughs> want such and such. So I was, it took me years of re repetition in those committee meetings for people on the committees to start 
saying what that survey had said and to instead of trying to talk about what their own particular opinions were did you find that uh, there were gender differences yes in the survey results and yes. in, on the committee too on the committee and in the survey results yeah absolutely so we found that men and women in the survey agreed almost perfectly when we were looking at um, the most preferred routes. So the, the bike paths, the multi-use paths, the separated bike lanes, residential street bike routes, they agreed almost completely. But when you got to the routes that were dicey, mixing with traffic, um, everyone liked those less, but men were more willing to ride on those than women. And that almost certainly in North America accounts for a huge difference in cycling between men and women. If you look at um, transportation modes from the census data in Canada, you see that it's pretty equal getting the commute to work trips by car for men and women, by transit men and women, walking men and women, it's about 50-50. But for biking, it's about three quarters men, a quarter women. And yet in Holland and Denmark, they have about 50-50 men and women riding. And it's almost completely the result of what we saw in our survey, that women just, when it's terrible conditions, they're not, not interested. So, and, so and you can see that in, even in Vancouver, as the bike routes have improved, in the areas where there are good routes, you see closer to 50-50 women riding in the areas of Vancouver where there are no good routes, it's, yeah, women don't ride. Can you tell us a little about the, about the, the, the moment when separated bike lanes became a reality in Vancouver? It was very controversial. Yeah. And how was, how were you involved, if at all, with that? Yeah, so the, so the one that started it all is the Burrard Street bike lane. And it was put in in about 2009, just as a trial, just uh, the year after Gregor Robertson and the Vision uh, Council got in. But that whole process was started about 10 years earlier. They had tried it then. And what had happened is this woman uh, was riding across the shared sidewalk um, across the bird bridge and got knocked off the bridge almost certainly by someone like me walking along talking with their hands got knocked onto the bridge deck and got hit and she had she didn't die but she had a massive head injury and she sued the city successfully and so the city realized they needed to do something way back then but when they did that trial really without much warning to drivers it was chaos the first day and although things improved over the next week, politicians just lost their nerve and they stopped it after a week. But this time it had come back and the council was willing to try. I was involved in the lead up, not, um, not because I was particularly advocating, but people knew that we, we had started our second study. So our first study is, where do people want to ride? But our second study was, which types of routes are safer versus less safe? And so that study had started in 2008. And by the time this, this idea of the trial came to council, we had about five months of data. And someone asked me, could you look through the data you have and see if there have been any crashes on the Broad Street Bridge. So everyone knew about this big crash over 10 years ago. So I thought, okay, so I don't normally look at data ahead of time, but I asked our study coordinator, uh, Melody Monroe, to have a look. And she went by hand through each of the several hundred crashes that we, we were um, studying at that point. And she found nine that were, were in that five month period, nine that had occurred on the Broad Bridge, and five of those had involved very similar circumstances where people had been knocked off onto the bridge deck. So potential catastrophes. And, and potential, that was potential economic catastrophe for the city because they oh, were all going to be lawsuits, right? Yeah, they could be. I mean, just the fact that it was 
that this same kind of crash was ongoing without people realizing it. Mm -hmm. And so I did present to the city and I, I know that there are many presentations to the city, so I don't know to what extent uh, our data weighed on people, but for sure the councillors sat up and listened to that, which they should, right? So I think it, it was one of the things that steeled their resolve to go through with a six month trial, mm -hmm. which they did. And it was, of course, extremely successful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So have you been involved in any of the subsequent um, controversies around, around separated bike lanes, Stanley Park or Point Grey Road? Well, you know, when it, certainly I get asked for our study results. And so our, our, um, our uh, injury study, uh, it was finished and analyzed in uh, 20 and published in 2012. And what was really, uh, it's interesting, I've been reading some of the stuff on the COVID clinical trials. And there's a great article in the New York Times today about the uh, heads of Pfizer and um, Moderna getting ready to see their first preliminary results and how nervous they were waiting to hear those results. I was the same way. When we, our statistician came to give me the results of our injury study, I was so nervous. I can just remember my heart was just <laughs> beating out of my chest and because what I was really worried about is what if the injury study results show different results from where people would like to ride? Like what if where people would like to ride is worse than where, <laughs> uh, than the places, than riding on the street, you know, that it would just be horrible because you couldn't, you couldn't decide what to do anyway. As luck would have it, <laughs> overall, not every single type of route, but overall, where people prefer to ride is safer than the routes where people don't want to ride. And so our study results, both studies, matched very well. And so it's easy to make recommendations to cities what they should do to build routes that are safe and protect their citizens and also encourage those citizens to ride. And so, yeah, I've gone to, I've presented about those results to many of the city councils in the Metro Vancouver region and um, across the country and um, and in um, some international forums as well. And uh, for sure, I mean, our results, especially for separated bike lanes, it was the first time those results were so clear and so dramatic. We found a, almost a tenfold reduction in risk for riding on a separated bike lane on a major street compared to riding uh, on a major street between parked cars and moving cars without any any protection. And of course, you know, to get to where you need to go, you have to ride on major streets, right? You have to ride on major streets to get to shopping, to get to offices, to get to schools and universities. So, you know, ha you have to have something that will protect you there. And, and our results showed those were fantastic. Did so yeah, you, lots of people interested. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Did you, um, did you have to deal with any of the sort of inconvenience to drivers um, arguments, the anti-bike laners? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, nothing like a politician would have to, or even an advocacy organization. But, you know, there, one of the cool things about uh, bicycling research in the last 10 years, it's been, there's been a lot more emphasis on infrastructure. Before that, almost all the bike safety research was about helmets and how to get people, you know, how they protect you after you've had a crash and how to get people to wear them. So, but in the last 10 years, there's been lots of women researchers <laughs> and uh, a lot more emphasis on uh, the bike route design, which is great. But one of the cool things about this is, uh, there have been a number of surveys done, including in Vancouver by the city, showing that not only 
uh, people when they're biking, but also people when they're driving prefer separated bike lanes. When oh, you're really? when people are, you know, there are a lot of vocal people, but they get outsized attention. I think in Vancouver, when they did the survey, I think they found about 60% of drivers prefer the separated bike lanes. And I can always remember my dad when he was getting older and he was listening to our study results. And he says, oh, he just found it so nerve wracking trying to drive along a route where a cyclist was having to ride right beside him without any, anything except paint in between. <laughs> You know, one of the interesting stories, too, for those of, uh, for folks from UBC is um, um, Gavin Stewart, who was Dean of Medicine, he was hit by uh, a driver mm -hmm. riding along uh, Southwest Marine Drive. And um, it was right at that intersection where 41st and Marine Drive and Camosun all come together. Right. And uh, he got hit in the bike lane and he had a concussion, a broken um, collarbone, I think. And uh, yeah, and I, I always remember, I, he gave me a great quote that I used in some of the city council meetings saying, you know, somehow paint didn't seem quite adequate <laughs> to protect him. So. so speaking of protection, um, WorkSafe BC has played such a, an important role in, in so many people's lives this year in particular. What yeah. is your um, input as a board member? Like, what do you do as a board member on WorkSafe BC? Yeah, that's a, it's actually, uh, I've been on the board for almost, well, about three years now, and uh, it's taken me a long time to figure out what my role is. It's the first time I've been on a, uh, a board of directors of an organization that size and um, it's a huge operation and it largely runs itself. Um, the role of the board is to set um, a vision and mission and strategies um, to monitor key indicators and also to um, point towards policies and approved policies. But a lot of that policy work involves um, staff consult consulting with management and labor reps, um, which is what they should do. And um, so much of it is us having a look before it goes out to those consultations and, and when it comes back. I found my role was tough at first because I, I really wasn't sure um, where, where my sort of academic lens would fit. But I think I've slowly but surely uh, figured out more that um, I can help point it. Point, that's, it's a really interesting board compared to many workers' compensation boards across the country. Most are just the insurance side. So a worker is in, injured and then uh, their salary and medical expenses are paid if it was deemed a workplace injury and they may have their rehabilitation um, uh, paid for and so and assessed and so on but worksite bc is unusual because it also has the whole prevention side in it as well so it has officers safety officers and hygiene officers that go out and inspect workplaces. And that's what we've been hearing about to do with COVID, right? Those inspectors have been helping workplaces figure out what they can do to make their workplaces as safe as possible in this pandemic. And, but that's an unusual, that's often done in other provinces by a Ministry of Labour, for example. Uh, when we were talking the other day, you mentioned, um, it just mentioned in passing, your colleague, Dr. Bonnie Henry, um, who is probably the biggest celebrity in BC <laughs> this year, the kind of woman of the year, 2020. Um, what, what's, your, what's your connection with her? Well, so Bonnie is the provincial uh, health officer. And uh, so her training after, well, she has lots of training in medicine, but uh, her training for that is, is what we call community medicine or, um, preventive medicine and 
our department, our school population of public health is the department that trains those folks. So there's a residency program in um, community medicine. And uh, so she didn't receive her training with us, but she is a member of the faculty and is one of the people who trains the new generation there. So I know her through that connection. So we have a, um, across the province, uh, many, many of the medical health officers that are, you know, completely wrapped up in this COVID response um, have been trained at, in our department. Um, and, and also there are many who've been trained elsewhere, for example, at the University of Toronto. But yeah, so it's really terrific to see her. You know, she published a book uh, in 2012, and it was called uh, Soap and Water and Common Sense. <laughs> and it, it suits this moment uh, so well. Can you get me her autograph? <laughs> <Her mask? laughs> I have not talked to her for even a second during this year. <laughs> Can't imagine any extraneous conversation she would No, have. I'll bet. <laughs> um, do you still um, ever cycle with your daughter? Yeah, well, that trip I took there just earlier this week, my daughter has actually just come moved back to uh, Canada from uh, Chicago uh, this fall, and uh, she and her uh, partner are living with us for the moment, and we went, we just went on that lovely cycle. I live uh, uh, near Dunbar and Marine Drive, and uh, so we cycled across 57th and then down to the River District. Uh, yeah, it's just... It's such, it's such a shame in a way that we have this wonderful False Creek um, uh, seaside path and we get to see the port side of Vancouver. But the Fraser River is a yeah. different kind of working river. And if you go down to the river district, you see all the log booms and the tugboats. And it just gives you that feeling of almost the old history of Vancouver yeah. uh, industry, which still does exist clearly, but not in at the scale that it used to. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic to go there, but it's, I'd love it if the, if the seaside route went right around UBC, all the way down the Fraser River out to Burnaby. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> it would be. What is your what's your favorite cycling route in, in Vancouver region? Yeah, um, yeah, you know, I was thinking about, you asked me that in the email that you sent, and um, I think what I really love to do is take different routes. I, I'm the kind of person, I get bored doing the same thing all the time, you can tell by my, uh, what I did in my exposure yeah, career, yeah. assessment career, but I love taking the residential street bike routes, a different one, and, all the time, and, um, and seeing where it leads me, and I, you know, yeah, one of the ones that I did recently that I thought, oh, this is so cool, was riding down Dunfries from 45th down to, um, well, near to the seawall. And uh, that's an area, I don't think I'd ever been down Dunfries before, but it's so cool. It was in the summertime and people were out in the parks and there's all these little coffee shops along the way. And, you know, it just, and, and people's gardens were so lovely, very, it, in general, small lots and a lot of the classic old um, craftsman style homes, and but the gardens are so great. Oh, just, yeah, I love doing that. Just exploring the different residential areas. It's a lot of fun. And you and your husband have done quite a bit of international cycling? Yeah, I don't know about quite a bit. There are lots of people who have done more, but yeah, when we were young, we used to um, uh, go places um, without, any backup we just we, we didn't camp very much we would normally just use youth hostels and cycle from youth hostel to youth hostel and you know one of my favorite trips was a really long one in europe and my favorite part was riding from glasgow up the locks like loch lomond and then across through the more mountainous areas and then down to uh, aberdeen edinburgh. And, and edinburgh and uh, along the way either the B&Bs or the um, youth hostels. A lot of them were in old castles. It's unbelievable, <laughs> just fantastic. <laughs> really, really fun. And more recently, my favorite ride was, uh, we went for um, 
a trip in Austria in the Valley of the Alps. And uh, man, the scenery was spectacular, just really good. You don't bike, you don't mountain bike, but you were biking in the mountains. Well, biking in the valley, you <laughs> have to know that. In <laughs> fact, the way they structured the route was you basically start high and you ride down. Yeah. It wasn't quite all flat, but it was yeah, yeah. definitely in the right overall direction. <laughs> They're good at that in those countries. Yeah. Um, for, for my 65th birthday, I did a half marathon in, in Switzerland. <laughs> but it was as everyone thinks thinks whoa half marathon in switzerland but it was it was around the, it was around the uh the shore of lake lucerne it was dead uh, flat it couldn't be <laughs> flatter <laughs> and again the scenery is spectacular the scenery is phenomenal yeah, yeah yeah um last question before we sort of open up the floor uh wh what do you see as um the future of uh cycling in vancouver uh, do you think we're going to sort of continue along this road of um, a more um, designated, separated um, bike lanes? Do you see something more radical happening? What's, what's, your, what's your vision? Well, my vision is that we won't need a bike map. We should, people often ask me that, you know, what is, you know, what is the ideal bike map? And, you know, and I think, you know, it should be like Holland, that you don't need a bike map. The map of the city, tells you everything you need to know and uh that's my vision is that we would just be able to ride without worrying that we always have a space for people who are cycling that is safe that there's place for people to walk for people to cycle and for people to drive and to take transit i mean that's a complete city and we're a long way for from that i mean the the downtown and the north west and central sectors are kind of getting there but um the far east part of the city and the south part of the city you know there's not much that lets us get to the shopping areas in those in those districts that are are physically separated bike routes there are some painted bike lanes or you know it's yeah, we've got a long, we've got a long way to go. And just to, I, I can't tell you exactly what the uh, mileage at the monument is separated bike lane is along the lines of maybe 25 kilometers. In Montreal, they're putting in another 50 kilometers, and they already have 120. In Seville, in Spain, <laughs> this is my one of my favorite stories. In Seville, in Spain, they had about a half a percent of trips that were done by bicycle. In, in Vancouver, it's about six to seven percent of trips now after quite a few years. Anyway, they had almost no one cycling. They had a new government. They decided in order to get people cycling, which they figured they needed to do rather than build up new road space, they decided they had to build a network quickly. So they designed a network and they implemented this 70 kilometers of separated bike routes in two years wow. and another 50 kilometers in the next two years. So they have 130 kilometers, or 120 kilometers of bike routes in four years. And the pace we're going is very slow. It may not feel slow to people who aren't yet biking, but I think to most people who are biking, you feel very constrained about where you can go in Vancouver. And with so, so many so, more, oh, sorry. I was gonna say, what, what, um, how did the statistics of uh, percentage of uh, cyclists change? Yeah, so they, they went up very quickly to uh, 7%. So they increased their cycling by not quite, by about 15 fold. So pretty good. Yeah, pretty impressive. And they comp they were doing a few things at the same time. They also had to they implemented a new rapid transit route, which cost them a billion dollars. Mean and um, the uh, cycle routes cost them in the you know like a ten million or something. So it was the comparison in price to the change in ridership was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It's a cheap well, way to accommodate people. Yeah. Well, you're, you're very persuasive. You're a very good advocate. Uh, 
for cycling. And, um, and you've managed to, to kind of flip the paradigm because what you were talking about before, the sort of the four stages of occupational or industrial hygiene, where the last stage is personal protective equipment. And Vancouver used to, that was the first stage for cycling advocacy, wear a helmet, but cycle on the road with cars. <laughs> um, and you've managed to flip that, which is fantastic. So congratulations. Yeah. Or you've managed to help. Help flip. Help, it. yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Help is the, you know, there are some fantastic people. Actually, one person who's on the line right now, Lisa Slakoff, who's worked for years with Hub, uh, which is the cycling advocacy group here, and um, has spearheaded some of the uh, the work on Kitts uh, Park and so on. So there's so many people who have worked so hard on this, including many of the staff at the city. So. Yeah, it's it's definitely a a major group effort, uh, not a, a a single person thing. All right. Well, thank you. I'm going to let you go to your dinner, and I'm going to go to my dinner, and everyone can <laughs> go to their dinners. And uh, thank you all for attending. And Kay, again, thanks for just a terrific talk. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate the interaction and the listening. <laughs> Good night, everyone.